Well, good morning, everybody. It's a great uh, day to be at church, a great weekend as we uh, do celebrate and honor all of our veterans. And as crazy as our country is at times in election year and all of the uh, challenges that we face, it's still a huge blessing, is it not, that all over across this country that men and women of God can gather corporately in, in public places and worship worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. And uh, yeah, you can clap for that. We, um, you know, it's, it's just something we don't ever want to take for granted and uh, don't know, you know, for how many uh, decades ahead that uh, the Lord would have that, but he's been very gracious to, um, gracious to us for, for many, many, many years. And uh, it's good, good to gather to, today as uh, the body of Christ. And, uh, you know, the body of Christ is filled with men and women. And we're going to talk about women this morning. And uh, we, we, I think we have some men in the house. Do we have any men in the house here this yeah. morning? Yeah. Oh, wow. We've got some excited men in the house, too. And that's awesome because uh, men, I just want to lay down the challenge. Uh, this Friday night is our Man Up dinner. Uh, we're going to eat manly food, whatever that means, in a manly way, whatever that means. And, uh, and then we're going to hear from a man of God, uh, Pastor uh, Mark Spansel is going to bring the word to us. It'll kick off just a great weekend, uh, just hanging out with the brothers in Christ here at Crossroads. And so uh, let me just lay down the challenge. If you're, if you're a man, okay, here's the challenge. If you're a man, you'll be there Friday night. If you're not a man, you won't be there, okay? So do you feel the pressure? You feel the pressure? Good. I'm glad you feel the pressure because I want to lay down the gauntlet, be there, uh, and be a man that night and join us, and we're going to have a great time. Uh, we continue our trek uh, through uh, and back to, if I could say it this way, our trek back to the origin of all things. And um, uh, well, I, I have this deep hunger in my, my own heart, a uh, hunger to see afresh God's grand design uh, uh, of all things, and uh, there's a, never been a greater time to look with fresh eyes back to the grandeur um, and the um, just the awesome design that our great Creator has made all things. And in Genesis two, we find ourselves. If you're new uh, here this morning. We, we're in Genesis two, and we find ourselves kind of in a mini series in this series called Origins. In this mini series in, in Genesis chapter two. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked, at, um, we looked at the topic of let men be men. This morning, we're going to look at uh, let women be women. And then next week, we're going to look at let marriage be marriage. And uh, we're trying to get back and peel back to the very beginning of time when all things were created by God for His glory and for our good. And so uh, we're, we haven't taken a deep dive into a lot of the cultural issues that we have uh, going on around us. Um, and some of you have asked, are we going to address some of those? And we are. We will take a deep dive on some of those, some of those kind of hot topics, if you will. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to preach the purity of the design first without trying to mar it up and answer all of the big kind of cultural questions. And so at the end of November, early December, we will look at some of the uh, aberrations and deviations from God's grand design. But we want to look at it, or at least I do, I want to look at it just with fresh eyes and not try to um, answer all of the questions, but just see what God designed uh, first before we go down some rabbit trails. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Excellent. Uh, so grab your Bibles, if I haven't told you already. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 2. And as you turn there, let me just say a quick prayer for us. Father, it's good for us to pray because we need your help. Um, we, we, uh, we all have a million things going on, first day of the week. Uh, a lot of us face uh, controlled chaos this week, and uh, it is hard to untangle our minds from the things of now. But I pray, Lord, just by your Spirit, you would unhitch our hearts and minds from, the, uh, from some of the pressing immediate things so that we can think deeply on some of the eternal things. And so, Father, let your Spirit rule and reign in our heart and mind. We pray this in Christ's name. And everybody said... Well, before we begin, I, I share this with each service. Uh, in this study of uh, men and women that we've been in, uh, in this discussion and study of male and female, he created a male and female. I want to be completely honest and open, transparent, when, with full disclosure. I just wanted to share this with you. Um, I was a man, I was a man trapped inside a woman's body. 
and then I was born. <laughs> now, now, some of you are still stuck on that first sentence, and you're already on your phones to, to findachurch.com. I get that. <laughs> But you need to hear the second part of my statement, then I was born. And when you think about it, uh, the, we, all sh we all owe our life uh, to our moms. For good or for bad, uh, uh, it is uh, through the gift of motherhood that we all live and breathe here this morning, that her life gave us life. And uh, when you think about it, women are amazing. Uh, we're going to talk about why they're amazing biblically here this morning, but they really are amazing just physiologically speaking. Uh, and us guys should marvel at this. This shouldn't be customer. A woman, you realize this, a woman can actually grow a human inside her body. You know, for us guys, that should freak us out, right? And uh, uh, the thing, I mean, a woman can actually grow a human inside her body is just an amazing, amazing truth. And this morning, we want to celebrate not the, the physiology of a woman. We want to celebrate the uh, theology of a woman. We want to celebrate the fact that God has uniquely created and designed a woman in ways um, that we can only dream of as, as men of going, wow, we, they are so gifted, they are, uh, they are so amazingly created by, by their designer. And this morning, we as a church, I want to remind us, we always want to be a church that celebrates uh, the distinctness um of gender. That we, we celebrate womanhood. We celebrate manhood here. Uh, that God has created male and female. And we don't back away an inch from that. And we honor and we celebrate that. And we're going to go back to the basics. We saw that with men uh, as we looked at them. Remember, men have, a, um, have, have this um, aspect of them that they were created. And you'll see this in women too. We're created in the mind and in the heart of God. Uh, that Adam himself was put in a garden. He has a calling on his life. Every man has a calling on, on their life. And then lastly, remember God told Adam, don't eat of this tree. And, and so he gave, he gave uh, man the, the prohibition that he was supposed to lead in and, and, and lead in with convictions and to be able to transfer convictions uh, to his own family and to his friends and uh, to his neighbors and so forth. And that's the distinctness of, of a man. And, and this morning we're going to look at the distinctness of a woman. And we live in a world uh, where humanity, men and women, are, are becoming like our milk, homogenized. And, and that's not the way God created them. We created a male and female, and uh, androgyny seems to be the, the in way of, I don't know, man or woman. No, we, we celebrate the distinction between a man and a woman. And this morning, ladies, let me just tell you something. Uh, I'm, it's going to be encouraging this morning. This is going to be a beat up on ladies. It wasn't a beat up on man because God doesn't beat up on us in Genesis chapter, in Genesis chapter 2. He's creating us uh, in perfect creation. And so we're going to look at a we're going to look, as we looked at a perfect man, we're going to look at a perfect woman here this morning. So I want you to leave greatly encouraged. I, I want you to see the, the grandeur and, and the glory of the design of a woman. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. It's freeing. And we want to honor and celebrate it. And I want you to do that with me and just with your own eyes. Look at Genesis chapter 2 and just look at verse 18. We're now going to pick up um, where God steps in to create uh, this this person called a woman in verse 18. Here's what Moses records by the Spirit of God. He says this, then the, uh, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, uh, the Lord God had formed every uh, had formed uh, every beast of the field and every bird of heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But, everybody say but. But, uh, but for Adam, uh-oh, but for Adam there, there was not found a helper fit for him. So, so the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took out one of his ribs. I always call it the prime rib. And he takes out one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from, from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And then the man said, this, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's a, it's a beautiful text. 
Um, it, it's a great portion of scripture because it, it peels right back to the creation of, of, of women. Uh, we saw God created a man out of the dust of the earth. Now he's going to create a woman out of the rib of a man. Therefore, we're both all created ultimately from dust and, and, and our bodies return to that upon death. But you're going to see in this passage, I think, just our, I think it's just screaming at us. Some of you, some of you are already there. It, it, it's just screaming at us that this incredible biblical design uh, that we've lost in our culture, and we want to get back to, of how God has uniquely created a woman here. It's a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a thing to be celebrated. And, and I, want you to, I want you to track with me this morning. So try to, try to lock on, double clutch, uh, you know, downshift into fifth gear with me and just just buckle up and hang on as we ride through this passage because I want you to see these very three kind of God marked things. Number one, write this down. Women are divinely, and I'm going to use this word divinely a number of times because God has marked these the the this creation. He marked man and he's also marked women. You know, women are divinely devised, if I could say it that way. Divinely devised. What do I mean by devised? Uh, women were born, catch this, don't miss this, women were born in the heart and mind of God. That's where women came from. Uh, you, women are not man's idea. Women are not, uh, uh, man said, hey, Lord, I, 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 want, I want someone to do this, this, and this for me. That's not at all what the Scripture teaches. The scripture teaches that women were devised, they were born, they were given birth from the mind and the heart of God. They were devised by God. Ladies, you are not an afterthought. And where do I get this? It's because in this passage, it is literally tattooed with God-initiated verbs. You see God at work in this passage. Just let your eyes drop down to verse 18. It says this, and the Lord God said, Look down at verse 19, the Lord God formed. Look at verse 21, the Lord God caused. Verse 22, the Lord God made. You see the fingerprints and the actions and the initiative of God himself. Uh, understand this, ladies, that you are God marked. You are God designed. And I will tell you this, and I will tell you this over and over again. Do not let the culture of magazines tell you what you're worth. You are worth to the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, because that's what He paid for you, and you are God-designed. It doesn't matter how your skin's wrapped around your bones. What matters is that you were designed and you were born out of the heart and mind of God Almighty, and He has declared His worth. Let no man put His worth on you. Now, we should clap at things like that because we need to get back to common sense because we've assassinated common sense and we've let everybody else dictate to us what somebody's worth. And God says, no, I initiated a woman. It's my idea. I have given her life. And what God does here is just amazing to me. God makes a very dramatic and bold statement. For six days of creation, everything God has created, he has called it one word, one word only, and the word is good. God doesn't make mediocre. He only makes what is good. And he, for the very first time in six days of creation, he looks out and he sees something and he says, that is not good. Now, it's interesting, and just look with your own eyes to the scripture there. When he says that, he's not saying that about his creation. He's not like, hey, you know, on second thought, I don't think those fish are that great. He's not looking at Adam going, wow, we got a lot of work to do on this one. That's not good. No, what he looks at is a situation. And the situation is what he says is not good. It's a bold statement because God, for the very first time, describes something as not good. He's always made perfection. Uh, I, I, I'm mediocre. I've told you this before. I, I'm not a good potter. Eighth grade, I took pottery class. Everything I made became an ashtray. My parents don't even smoke, and, 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 and I just wasn't good at it. But when God creates something, he, he always creates perfection in what is good. Now he looks at a situation, not creation, and he calls it not good. God in his God head, this, this three-in-one God being who, who sits in the throne room of heaven with the seraphim and the cherubim whipping around his throne day and night, crying out, holy, holy, holy. He makes 
in his own mind, his own heart, his own volitional will, he makes a unilateral decision by saying, I look at this Adam, I look at this man, and it is not a good situation. Why? Because it is not good, he says, for man to be alone. Um, that is a massive statement. I'd love to preach on that uh, at some point, but I can't today. But I will say this. It's not just the fact that man was alone. It is never a good idea for God's people to be alone. We were created to be in relationship. God has existed in eternity past in the Godhead, three persons in one in relationship. And bad things happen when a God-fearing man or woman gets alone. And God says, therefore, it's not good to be alone. And the tragic part is some of the loneliest places on the planet are in the church. And my heart breaks for that. And we've had lonely people in our church because we're not a perfect church either. But God has created us to be a family so we don't do life alone. It's never a good thing. And in this situation, God declares not good. And so what does God decide to do? He decides in his own volitional will that he is going to make someone He's going to make someone very good. And this very good someone is going to fulfill man's aloneness conundrum. You know, Adam, Adam wasn't fully aware until God pointed it out that he was, in a, he was not in a good situation. And so God decides, I'm going to make someone very good to fulfill this conundrum that you are in. How do I know that's what God did? You see it with yourself. Look at verse 18. God makes a divine declaration. Three words. I will make. Did you catch those? I will make. God sees a situation that is not good, and then three words he puts together. He says, I will make. I will fix this. I will change this. That's why, ladies, you are, you are divinely de devised by God. It's his idea to create you. It's his fingerprints that are over you. He holds the patent on womanhood. Go to Washington, D.C., try to pull a patent on a woman, and you're going to see God's name right next to it. He's the designer of women. He is the one that has created them. He has marked them. Ladies, you are marked creation. You are God marked by God himself. And I will tell you this, ladies, something you need to hear. Every, every female eye up here, I'm not sure there's a difference between male and female eyes, but who knows. Every female eye up here, let me just tell you something. Your God is not a high priest who doesn't understand you. He created you. He knows you. He made your frame. He knows you extremely well, and he doesn't just know facts about you. He knows how you feel. Why? Because he's a high priest who can sympathize with you. Don't ever think that God is some distant deity to the ladies in this room. He is an intimate creator and designer of all women. He holds the patent. Now, what's interesting is he, 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 he says it's not good that man be alone. So what, what happens next? Look at verses 19 and 20. All of a sudden, 19 and 20, it gets kind of crazy here for a moment. He declares to Adam, hey, it's not good for you to be alone. Adam's like, okay, if you say so, you're God. And then in verse 19, where we have what I call the parade of the animals. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of heaven and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. <laughs> I mean, think how this goes, right? He says, it's not good for you to be alone. Okay, I get that. So all of a sudden, God starts the parade of the animals and brings them by. You have to think after, you know, the rhinoceros and the alligators and the mosquitoes and the cats, Adam's thinking, <laughs> you're going to choose from this bunch? Like, this is one of the, like, you know, that, that's cool, but I don't want to sleep with that. That's, uh, yeah, that's crazy. But you know what I think? Bible over here, Pastor Todd over here. One more. I think, I think what happened, because we know that the animals went on the ark two by two. I think what happened in the parade of the animals is that those animals came by two by two. God declared it's not good, Adam, for you to be alone, and then God showed him a massive, massive illustration of it. And I think by the time the parade of the animals ended, he was like, you're right, God. I don't have anybody like me. I'm not interested in them. 
And so he began to name them. Some of our critics who say, oh, you've got to check your brains when it comes to Christianity and it comes to Genesis. How in the world would he name all the creatures on the planet? Well, I don't think it's that difficult. In fact, if you want to get really pragmatic about it, God created species, he created kinds. We have developed a much broader name for species than what we see in the Bible when it says kinds. And we talked about that in Genesis 1. And so the number of kinds, I think, is, is greatly reduced compared to the number of species that we use today. In fact, most, um, uh, mo- mo- most theologians would say it's probably reasonable to say that Adam could name probably ten um, kinds every minute. That means in about five hours he could name 3,000 kinds. The, the idea that he named all of them is not crazy thought. I don't have to check my brain. He could do a full eight-hour workday and probably capture all of them or most of them just in one day. So the idea that he was able to name those kinds is not crazy talk by any means. And so he names them. He doesn't name them just to be cute. This is not like, uh, uh, this is not like Dr. Doolittle on an, an, an amphetamines. This is, this, is, this is Adam looking at the... F- the form and the function of an animal, the species, and giving it a name. And what's interesting is he was given the responsibility to subdue the earth. Remember, he was put in the garden by God himself. He was given responsibility. He had a call in his life. And one of the signs of responsibility is you get to name. When you name something, you have a certain sense of responsibility, authority over it. As parents, we name our kids, do we not? Right? The, the, the person in the waiting room doesn't name our kid. The nurse that delivered the, the baby doesn't name our kid. The parents do. I have three very expensive kids, and my, my, middle, my middle child, she, when she was born, you know, you, nowadays you're in the hospital for like three hours, right? And you got to get out right away. And we, we had so many names, we did, couldn't pick a name. And we get ready to leave, and they said, You can't leave the hospital without naming your kid. And so I, I remember thinking, I asked her, I said, so are you saying that we can leave, but she, could, she would stay? Don't tempt me here. I mean, just until she sleeps through the night, and then we'll come back and get her. But, but, the, but the whole point of the story was, is we, we couldn't literally take her home from the hospital until we had legally given her a name to leave. And so the, the idea of naming here is a, another statement of Adam's responsibility of this garden that he is now superintending here. And so he names all of these animals, and Adam notices he really is all alone. Second part, number two, number two, write this down. Not only are women divinely devised, in other words, thought through, forethought of God, you're not an afterthought, ladies, but you also, women are divinely designed. Now we're going to get down in the weeds of this, of this passage. So what happens in verse, uh, verses 21 and 22, we see God actually creating a woman, and it is awesome to watch. I mean, I, this, is, this is a Kodak moment for sure. And notice how it all begins in verse 21. Notice, notice what Mo, uh, Moses records. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. This is really cool. This is crazy cool. So God says, okay, I need to create a... a, a uh, a person who is uh, suitable, uh, uh, a helper fit for you because it's not in the animal kingdom. So what does he do? He causes Adam to go into a sleep and we have the very first surgery ever performed. And it's a surgery not to fix anything in the sense of problem inside of his functioning creation because remember, Adam is perfect at this moment. No sin. And so you have to ask yourself, well, oh, I know why God caused him to go to sleep because when you have surgery, you best be asleep, right? Right? That's how I want to have surgery. I, uh, yeah, they put me on the table every time. I just say, make sure I'm out. And I never wake up until it's over, right? Because we, we don't want to feel what? We don't want to feel what, church? Pain. You know where pain came from? Chapter 3. The fall hasn't happened yet. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There's no death or disease. There's none of that. So why did God put him to sleep? Bible over here, Pastor Todd over here now. My guess is this, when you think about it, of all of creation, man never saw God create anything. Only the angels saw creation happen, and they rejoiced, it says. But man never saw 
God actually creating. He awoke and became a person and had functional capability to think and to see and to hear and touch and taste. But he only experienced fully developed functioning creation. I think God put him back to sleep again and said, no, this is something very sacred that happens. You're not going to see this one either. You didn't see the heavens go, go into place. You didn't see the waters and the beasts of the field. You didn't see any of that. You ain't going to see what I'm going to create next. And so he puts him to sleep, and then Adam, Adam is now asleep, and God begins to perform, the, for the best of the word I can think of, is, is a ribdectomy. <laughs> right? He takes, out, he takes out one of Adam's ribs, right? And, and he removes the rib. Now, some really um, not-so-smart theologians in years past said, well, you know what happens? That means men have one less rib than women, okay? That doesn't, that doesn't float, okay? Because if I have my gallbladder removed, that doesn't mean my three kids don't have a gallbladder, right? So, so don't end up with that type of thinking because that type of thinking is stupid, all right? And, and we want to think, think biblical and we want to think truthful. It's not, that, it's not that men now have one less rib. However, Adam did die. When Adam died, Adam did die with one less rib than Eve did for sure. But he didn't pass that on generationally to, to all men. And so what's interesting here is God says, I'm going to pull this rib. And I think the rib is a massive, I mean, I think it's a massive explanation point of God himself. What's interesting, the old uh, Puritan, his name was Matthew Henry. Here's what he said about God picking the rib. I think it's fascinating. He says, the woman, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be beloved by him. I don't know what you think of that quote, but I think that, that's, that's money right there. I think that's, I, I, I love that. And I, could have God, yes or no, could God have grabbed any bone in Adam's body and made a woman? Yes or no? Yes. yes. I think he picked a rib on purpose. I think it was to teach us something. And the way, he, the way he explains it to us makes a perfect sense that this is very unique. That, that women were, were designed, women were designed to complement man, not to compete or conquer man. And it's very interesting when you think about it. In verse 18, God makes a statement. He says, I need to, I need to make a, a person, someone who is, and here's the, here's the word, at least in the English Standard Version, a helper fit for him. Now, ladies, before you start frothing in the mountain, your eyes roll back, and you say, Marty, get into the glory, and here we go. Don't go there yet. Well, remember, we're taking Hebrew text and trying to give it English words, and sometimes... Those aren't always the best. So let's unpack this when God says, I want to make a helper fit for him. Circle the word helper in your Bible. What's interesting, it's the Hebrew word. It's, 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 the, it's the Hebrew word, azir. Azir. Everybody say azir. Azir. Uh, what's interesting about this Hebrew word, it, it, literally, it literally has a, a wooden meaning. And here's the wooden meaning. It means a counterpart who helps accordingly. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word that describes somebody who is of equal capability. It's of, of great likeness, therefore can be of great help. If God had put, if God had put um, Adam together with a camel, that would have been horrible for both of them. It would have been non-functional. It would have been non-corresponding. It, it would have been non-workable. So God says, I'm going to make someone who is, who is corresponding to, who, who is this, in the Hebrew word, a zir, who, who can come alongside and actually be of the same purpose as him. Now, before you think this is derogatory, you've got to realize something, that it's the same word that is used over and over and over again in the Old Testament to describe God himself. God is called the Azir of Israel. So we've, we've read this passage, you, we've sung this passage, Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. The psalmist cries out, where will my help come from? Will, where will my Azir come from? And then he answers himself in, in verse 2. My 
help, my azir will come from the Lord God. 1 Samuel 7, 12. Israel, who is your azir? Who is your help? The Lord God himself is your azir. This is not a derogatory term when you use a word to describe the very creator of the universe. This is, this is a word that describes a creation that is unlike all of the other creation that can come alongside another person who has personhood, who is of equal worth, but we have distinct gender here. He created a male and female. We're not embarrassed by that. We don't backpedal on that. Men are like men and women are like women and we don't homogenize them together. He created them distinctly different. We celebrate that. We don't obliterate that as Christ followers. We, we share equality together. Ladies, again, what dangles from your ankle is a price tag and on it, it says one Jesus Christ. You are distinctly equal with man, but you are distinctly designed differently than man. Case in point, let me give you an example. If I take 10 pennies and I put 10 pennies in my left hand, I have 10 cents. If I take a dime and I put it in my right hand, are they equal? Yes or no? Yes. Not a hard question. Yes or no? Yes, yes they are. Are they the same? No. no, they're very different. They're very different. We, we live in a culture that wants to, wants to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. For there to be equality, there must be sameness. Loved ones, that's not logical, let alone biblical. The distinct gender, he says, I will create a, an azir, a, a person who comes alongside him. Parents, I ask you, who's worth more to you? Your daughter or your son? They're of equal worth. But if they're like mine, they're distinctly different. One can get dressed in five minutes. The other gets dressed in five hours. Very different. But I'll tell you this, I'll lay, I'll lay down my life for either of them. They're of equal worth. He, he pushes it a step further. Notice this. He says, not only a helper fit for him, but notice he, he does use that word fit. So you have this, you have this Hebrew word azir. Now he introduces this word fit in the English. If the Hebrew word is negeg, it, negeg simply means this. It means according to the opposite. A, 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 a woman is man's matching opposite. Again, equal worth, distinct gender. In other words, if you put a man t and a woman together, they stare into the face of the Adam, meaning this, manhood, humanity. See, when, when Adam saw Eve for the very first time, he looked at her, and he saw something that didn't look like anything from the parade of animals. He looked at somebody and goes, man, this, this, is, a, this, this is like me. We, we, we share, this is, this, this is a perfect, we use the English word fit. Some of you have, say, suitable, corresponding to. You see, what, what a woman does is, is she, brings, she brings to the table equal worth and she brings to the table distinctness in her gender that man doesn't have and the woman doesn't have what the man has, but we'll see next week they get married and the two become one flesh. Now man, humanity could do what exactly what God would require of them to subdue and to dominate and to rule and reign over the, the earth they could do it because there was distinct genders of equal worth but distinctly unique. Ladies, let me just tell you something. When you hear that phrase, a helper fit for him, don't you ever let some pagan... Um, <laughs> be, be nice, Todd. <laughs> just some pagan um, tell you you are, you are man's lackey. That's what the Bible tells you. That's misogyny. God purge that from every man that thinks that. Bring them down and bring them, bring them low. You're not man's lackey. You're not man's Lord. You're not man's lackey. We, there's equal, Christ died for both. But we are distinctly, thank you, Jesus, distinctly different. 
And we celebrate that. We honor that. We, we're not embarrassed or, or ashamed of that. Number three, we finish with this. Number three, not only are you ladies divinely devised, you're divinely designed, you're, you're someone who corresponds to us as men. In verse 22, we start, verse 22 and verse 23, we see that women are a divine delight. You're, you're a divine delight. You say, Ty, where do you get that from the text? I get that right from the text. Look in verse 22. It says, In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. What's the first thing he does with the woman after he makes her? He brought her to the man. He, he didn't hide her from the man. He didn't work on her further. He created women in perfect uh, uh, in, in, in perfection. At this moment in time, there is no fallen nature. There is no sin. Eve is a crowning creation of God. And, and here's what he does. The very first thing he says, I've got to bring this to Adam. He's going to be, he's going to be out of his mind. God doesn't, God, doesn't, God doesn't set you back in the garden. Hey, you go back in the garden and start cooking food while Adam's out here. No, he brings her, just as a father brings that bride down the aisle, the father, God, brings Eve to Adam. Why? Because she is a divine delight. Eve was the perfect prototype for all women. She was perfect in every area in every way. She was perfect relationally, emotionally, perfect spiritually, perfect physically. Everything about her was the statement of perfection. And God brought her like this bride to this groom that needed, that needed this, this bride, this woman. And man's reaction, Adam's reaction, did you catch this? Adam's reaction is a little bit over the top, if you didn't pick it up. It's really over the top. Look at, look at verse 23. It says, then the man said, and let me give you the, let me give you the straight Hebrew on this. It's, it, here's what Adam said. He says, then the man said, she is hot. <laughs> That's a word-for-word -word literal translation of the Hebrew right there, all right? We got a little bit more, we had a little bit more words. No, just kidding. He, but he does. This is a burst, okay? It's been quiet. Adam's had the parade of animals. He went to sleep. He woke up. And he's probably thinking, oh, oh my, is he still stuck on some animal for me? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God, God comes walking up with this, <laughs> this perfection. And notice what Adam says. Adam says, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. What does he say there? He says, she's like me. You, you, made, you made somebody corresponding to me. I, I can reason. I can tell. We can, we, this is going to work really well. The camel, no, but her, Yes. And what, what's great is he doesn't, you see, we, we think of blood, right? When we think of somebody corresponding like a relative, a blood relative. He doesn't say blood here. I mean, he's not in Arkansas by any means. And he says, he says, he says right here, he says, no, she's not like a blood relative. No, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She corresponds to me. God, you're awesome. This is exactly, this is exactly what fixes my, now I know why you said I'm alone. Look at her. And the Lord's like, yeah, I, I told you. I told you I make perfect creation. What Adam saw here, he, he saw himself in the mirror in, in, in essence, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Adam was like, I, there's going to be incredible intimacy with this, with this woman. I, I, this, is a, this is unbelievable. And so what, is, what does Adam do? He names her. He says, and she shall be called she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The Hebrew word is isha. What's interesting is, is man being male is ish. You add shaw, you add, that's the femininity you add. It's a female in essence. I know it sounds funny in our culture today, but it's a female man. Don't let our culture define that phrase. 
To feed, it, it, it's, in other words, I'm looking into a mirror. This is, this is an ish. It's an ishaw. <laughs> and I'm excited about this because we correspond. And now a perfect man names perfect woman. What I love about this, and I hope you do too, is I love the picture of this. Don't you love the fact that God was the first father of the bride? I mean, isn't that a cool thing? God was the first pastor to officiate a wedding we'll see next week. And God brings this bride and hands this bride to this groom. You see how grand that design is? You see how beautiful that is, how perfect that is? That two people who are distinctly different but correspond perfectly together. And God says, she's a divine delight. Let me bring her to you. And in essence, God walks her down the aisle. I've told you many times, one of the joys of being a pastor is to officiate weddings. You stand down at the end of that aisle and you see the father of the bride bring that beautiful bride down. The, the little girl he taught to ride a bike and to sing songs and play the piano and play games and you know all the things that growing up that dad teaches to a little girl and she, she's just glowing and he's walking her down right to the end of the aisle and then all of a sudden he hands off this precious bride to this ape. <laughs> Swindoll calls it, it's like handing a Stradivarius to an ape is really what it's like. Uh, it's a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture. What's so cool is, you know, God, God, um, God's sovereign. And I was thinking about this uh, as of yesterday. This is a beautiful picture for, for, for us right now as a family because um, 31 years ago, God gave me Stacy. Stacy gave me three kids. I only have three kids on the planet. They're very precious to me. I only have three of them. And uh, my oldest daughter, Natalie, uh, she gave me uh, a son, a son-in-law. Love him to death. And then yesterday, my middle daughter told us that she's going to be giving me another son next summer. And, and we're really ex we're just beyond excited. And I was just thinking, it's so beautiful how God's music of creation and design just marches on. And next summer, I'll walk her down the aisle and I'll hand her off to that ape and someday they, they will repeat the process because God's design is amazing. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your, your grand design. Forgive us for letting it become opaque. Um, Lord, I, I read this passage and I, I, see, uh, I see profound simplicity. And, and Father, help us, help, us, help us just to come back and, and rejoice in your design. Sometimes, Lord, we want to argue your design first, but I think it's better for us to start with rejoicing and celebrating this grand design of yours. We know things will get challenging in chapter 3, but we're, we're just, Lord, we're in chapter 2 right now, and we celebrate this amazing gift of womanhood. And Father, I pray for every woman in this room. May your, may your face shine upon them this week. May goodness and mercy chase them all the days of their life. And Father, may you lift the heavy burdens that they must carry at times. And Father, would you be kind and gracious to each of them. Lord, we want to be a church that honors and celebrates womanhood. We want to think biblically about what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Because you, you, you nailed it. It's a perfect design. 
So, Father, we're, we're just grateful, and we, we thank you. We thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, in whose, whose name we pray this morning. Amen.